So I'd like to uh, now move on to our second presentation and uh, uh, Professor Vishali Gupta from Chandigarh, a, a real expert in the field of uh, infectious diseases, uh, will uh, give us a presentation on infective choroiditis. So I'd like to thank Professor Gupta for joining us. Uh, thank you. A very good afternoon to everyone from India. I would like to thank SOE and especially Carlos Previsio for giving me this opportunity to speak on infective choroiditis. Well, when we talk of choroiditis, it is indeed a very close call between infective or non-infectious. Now here are the three diseases, the top one, AMPI, which is idiopathic, the middle one, tuberculosis, and the down below here is syphilis, placoid, choroiditis. Now, when we look at these phenotypically, it's very difficult to actually say which one of them probably could be infective or non-infective, especially for the beginner because they all resemble each other. So how do we do this? Uh, we first see whether it is choroiditis or retinochoroiditis. Then we look at if there is associated involvement of the optic nerve head and retinal vessels. Does it have any other clinical feature that will fit into a known infective or non-infective entity? Is there any anterior segment inflammation, vitreitis, scleritis, CNB associated with it? The lesion that we are seeing, is it unifocal or multifocal? Unilateral or bilateral? Does it have any associated systemic features? Is it recurrent? And if so, what was the previous episode like? And finally, is it responding the way it should be responding to the therapy that one has started? Let's apply this algorithm to some of the very commonly seen situations in day-to-day -day practice. Now, I would like to share with you all the example of a 29-year-old lady. And uh, this is how she presented to us. She had received intravitreal triumphs alone, oral corticosteroids, and even TB treatment eight months ago. And since last eight months, actually she has been on treatment when she came to us. Now her visual acuity is counting finger at this point of time. The disease is unilateral. Is it retinochoroiditis or chorioretinitis? Well, it's primarily retinochoroiditis where choroid is involved secondary to it. There is associated vitreitis. Patient is immunocompetent. And as I mentioned previously, it is a unilateral disease, and you can see there is some scar here and the diffuse patches of retinochoroiditis. Important point that I mentioned is sometimes it's very important to look at the past episode. The patient has been on treatment since last eight months, but, but what did the disease look like eight months ago? This is the pictures that the patient was carrying with her that was taken before starting TB treatment or anything. Now, when you look at this clinical picture, this was a clear cut case of toxoplasma retinochoroiditis, which was confused with choroiditis. And that caused patient very heavily as you can see, the patient had developed a very diffuse form of choroiditis like this one because she was given corticosteroids. So when we saw the patient, we had done the complete workup, including the diagnostic vitrectomy to clear the haze and all which showed the toxocyst. So this shows the important of, importance of recognizing the phenotype so that you don't inadvertently start corticosteroids and cause a lot of visual morbidity to the patient. The second example is the case like this one. Now, this is a phenotype when we look at it, it's peripapillary, pseudo, 
cordia like which are coming out from the optic disc there is no vitritis and if you look carefully on autofluorescence as well it's the edges of the pseudopodia which are active now this is the kind of the disease when you look at the phenotype you know it is serpiginous coronitis centrifugal spread exposure of choroidal vessel on healing and minimal pigmentation so when i see a very classic phenotype like this we do understand this is going to be non infective most of the times though it is important to rule out some infections like tb but by and large the classical variety of serpiginous may be just the autoimmune variety and you can see here the progression of the faf over 16 months now what is interesting and the points that i would like to draw attention there is no multifocality this one is the autoimmune variety the multifocality when you see multiple lesions coming that actually indicates that the underlying infection might be playing a role so this is the one which is suggestive of the classic variety of serpiginous choroiditis that is that was in this patient autoimmune in nature on the other hand there is another example of a patient a 27 year old male who complained of decreased vision of sudden onset painless progressive actually it started with pain and redness in the left eye 6 days after the onset of decreased vision so when we look at it there is choroiditis which is multifocal it's not the phenotype which we saw in the previous patient there is vitritis and there is peripapillary involvement also it's unilateral and you can see lot of involvement around the disc but then there are multiple patches of choroiditis which are coming over everywhere in addition the patient also has a patch of scleritis on top of that so now this will becomes an important information because when we look at this phenotype it's multifocal vitritis inflammation and scleritis along with it now these things do not fit into the classic non infectious type of serpiginous choroiditis so what do we do here the imaging of course is just to establish the involvement of the choroid on icg and to show the multifocality and the fluorescence shows like you would expect multifocal serpiginoid choroidopathy to be so what do we do here we do the oct the oct does shows there is a response all the test for the tb are positive so this is how the patient is uh these are the tests which were done for tb ppd scan test was 20 to 20 quantiferon tb gold was positive ct chest shows central lobular nodules and mediastinal lymph node and ebus was positive for tuberculosis so you can see the involvement of the outer retina and the choroid like you would expect in tb and this is following treatment responding to att and steroids so how do you differentiate a uh, autoimmune from tb serpiginous like uh, choroiditis the autoimmune variety tends to be bilateral whereas tb serpiginous is mostly unilateral the autoimmune variety would not have any cells in the vitreous or interior segment so any time you see a diffuse serpiginous like choroiditis and cells in the vitreous think of associated infective cause autoimmune variety has the lesions beginning in the juxta papillary area where serpiginous like choroiditis generally begins in the posterior pole this is not multifocal serpiginous is multifocal and in the serpiginous typical variety you may have pigment clumping at the border whereas tb generally shows healing in the center please remember that all the infective choroiditis multifocal will not be tb it is just the expression of the disease irrespective of the infective etiology for example this young lady 
32-year-old with vitreitis, multifocal lesions, unilaterally, mostly in the posterior pole when you see, you think of the classical uh, example which I have shown you is TB surficinus like choroditis. So always investigate for TB. But please remember that though TB will be very common in the area that are endemic for tuberculosis, we cannot really ignore other infections. So this lady also had history of PCV infection about 16 weeks ago, and her aqueous done was positive for VCV. So though it looked like typical tuberculosis, this was not really tuberculosis, because of the correlation with VCV, she was treated as VCV, and this is how she responded to therapy. But note, the pigmentation here on healing was not as much as we would see in tuberculosis. Another example of a patient who was referred to me long, long time ago in 2007 as the case of serpiginous choroditis, but actually it was a syphilitic with the active serpentine edge, the placoid syphilitic of uh, this thing. So patient was positive, both TPHA and VDRL and receives treatment for syphilis. And you can see the healing of the lesion here in the bottom panel. So, serpiginous like choroditis, when you see, always think of infection and always investigate to rule out the possible infection. Uh, we have reported mostly on tuberculosis, which is very common with us and coming from the reports from all over the world. TB is a very important cause of serpiginous like choroditis. But please remember, many a times, infections other than tuberculosis could actually manifest as serpiginous like choroditis. Now we come to multifocal variety of choroditis. So when we discuss the multifocal choroditis, I will show the example of this lady who is a 57 year old lady, comes to us with painless progressive decreased vision for one month. She did give history of trauma to the opposite eye with stone in 2013, and the left eye was, uh, after trauma, lost. It was a thysical eye, actually. Now, when we first saw her, she had something happening in the peripapillary area. There was fluid, and there were some patches, you know, these yellowish-white choroditis patches scattered all over. We did the fluorescent, which showed a very hot disc and something happening, some vascular minimal leak here, and these patches, which were really not typical of anything in the mid periphery of the right eye. Fluorescent showed, which I thought could be a juxtapapillary membrane, but there was, uh, you know, mainly the peripapillary swelling, the choroid was thick. And we kind of in, uh, did the initial investigations, but uh, you know we labeled it as sympathetic ophthalmia because all other investigations were negative. So she was treated on systemic corticosteroids and as a thiophrane to which she initially did show some response. But three months later, you can see there is progression of these lesions. And this was one of my last points when I showed the algorithm that in case you find the disease is not responding the way it should be, just think that whatever diagnosis of non-infective variety you have made could be wrong and you might have missed out on an infection. So when three months later we realized the patient was not responding, we repeated the test and they did show that there was active inflammation ongoing. Uh, even in the periphery, we could see there was a choroidal involvement and this was more of a focal over the patches. So her tests were TB were positive. CT chest showed multiple calcific lesions in both upper lobes of the lung. Uh, Montius was 18 by 18, Quantiferon was positive. We even did the whole body PET scan, which showed subcentrimetric mediastinal lymph nodes. 
And uh, we were not really sure because the phenotype really did not fit with TB. So the question here was, was the ocular disease due to tuberculosis? Or these tests are positive because we have given her corticosteroids and immunosuppression. So in consultation with the patient, we did the enucleation of the opposite blind eye and histopathology showed that there was granulomatous inflammation in this eye and we could find this acid fast bacillus sitting there, which was positive on PCR as well. Meaning that what we were diagnosing as sympathetic ophthalmia was actually TB multifocal choroiditis. And this is how the patient <laughs> is <coughs> sorry, responding to anti-TB therapy. So to sum it all up, when you look at the choroiditis, first look at the phenotype. Is it diffuse? Is it multifocal? If it is diffuse, is it retinochoroiditis or chorioretinitis? If it is mainly retinochoroiditis, for example, I showed you the first patient with diffuse toxoplasma. So if it is retinochoroiditis and diffuse, there are two possibilities. Either it could be toxoplasma, which invariably always have the involvement of underlying choroid, or it could be viral. Viral does not have involvement of choroid, and you can easily look at this on OCT. The other is serpiginous variety of choroiditis, which is predominantly choroiditis with some changes in the overlying outer retina. Serpiginous can be autoimmune variety, which is uh, serpiginous choroiditis, or it can be serpiginous like, which can be infective. So I have already highlighted these differences. So if you think it is autoimmune variety and there is no evidence, treat it as, as autoimmune, no need to investigate it too much. But if your patient is not responding the way patients should be, just hold back and investigate thoroughly. But if it has the features which are suggestive of possible infective etiology, always investigate to rule out infectious etiology. Now, when we come to multifocal variety, you can have a very classic phenotype like PEC, mutes, MP, which are non-infective and you don't have to investigate them. You investigate only if you find the patient is not responding or something is not right. And anytime you see atypical phenotype, please always investigate to rule out infections. So this is the conclusion of my talk, and I hope I am able to convey my point of how to differentiate between the infective and non-infective variety of choroiditis and how to have a very strong suspicion of choroiditis being infected. Again, once again, I would like to thank SOE for the kind opportunity to allow me to speak to all of you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Vishali. Uh, it's a very challenging uh, area when we think about all the possible problems that we are you know, looking in, seeing the patient for the first time and, and making the differentiations of what it could be, if it's choroid or retinal and uh, the different phenotypes that you talked about. I think your presentation was very um, clear in terms of your thinking process, which is really very helpful in and making the decisions uh, of which way you go. And, and as you showed, the wrong decisions can lead to disastrous outcomes. Um, um, thank you for that, Vishali. And 